Hello and welcome to chapter 2.4. This is water. This is the last video for chapter 2. So let's go. Now water is found everywhere. 70% of our body is water. So what's so special about it? Uh, what are its properties? Let's go. So water is considered as dipole in nature. So we don't say it's charged, we say it's dipole. And that's because the oxygen has a slight negative charge and the H atom has a slight positive charge. So usually we draw it like this. This is slight negative, this is slight positive, and slight positive. This is because of the unequal distribution of electrons inside the molecule. Okay, so the electrons tend to gravitate towards the oxygen, giving it a slightly negative charge. That's very chemistry. Now, what you need to know is that because of this slight positive and negative charge, this dipole nature of water, this allows the formation of hydrogen bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen of different molecules. And this is how we draw hydrogen bonds. We draw them with this dotted line here. Hydrogen, slightly positive, attracted to oxygen, which is slightly negative. Makes a lot of sense. Now, like in proteins, hydrogen bonding is considered to be an individually weak bond, but many hydrogen bonds can be formed at the same time, and this makes it cumulative strong, and, and this results in many properties of water. And these are the properties of water we'll be looking at. Number one, high specific heat capacity. Now, heat, specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 1 kg of water by 1 degree. This is a chemistry definition. What's the bio version of this? In simple words, this is what we mean. When we say water has high specific heat capacity, we mean that a large amount of energy is needed to raise the temperature of water by 1 degree. So this is because um, of hydrogen bonding in water. And if you want to raise the temperature of water, you need a large amount of energy to break the many, many H bonds inside. Now, what is the good thing about this? Why is it good that it takes a large amount of energy to raise the temperature of water? Wouldn't it make, wouldn't it make like boiling water a nightmare? Okay, well, that's besides the point, right? But um, in our bodies and in the environment in general, this provides a stable temperature or environment. The more water it is, the more stable. So like human body, 72% water. This is great because uh, our, if we go out in the sun, we won't immediately boil. We need some time for temperature to raise, right? The more water that is, like in a lake, that is going to require even more energy, okay, in order to raise the temperature because there are even more hydrogen bonds in there. And this acts as a buffer against sudden temperature change. Therefore, temperature of water does not change that quickly. Secondly, water has a high latent heat of vaporization. What do we mean by latent heat of vaporization? Here's the fancy definition you don't need to remember, but the idea is this. Large amount of energy is needed for water to evaporate, again, due to the hydrogen bonding water. Why? Now, why is this good? Um, this is because when water does evaporate, it removes a large amount of heat. So this is really important as a cooling mechanism because like this dark panting and us sweating, when our sweat evaporates, when we've got dogs like saliva evaporates from its tongue, this removes a large amount of heat and enables our body to cool down. So it's good that water has a high latent heat of vaporization. The next one, water also has a high latent heat of fusion. Basically, water also needs to lose a large amount of heat to freeze. You need a lot of energy to evaporate. You also need a lot of energy to freeze. Why is that? This is due to hydrogen bonds between water molecules. This provides stable habitats for aquatic organisms and make them less likely to freeze. 
And to add on to that, ice is less dense than water because you can see here, liquid water, you can see hydrogen bonds concentrate and reform, but you can see this ice state, it crystallizes the structure and therefore ice becomes less dense than water, okay? And it floats. And therefore, in icy lakes and you know in Antarctica, the surface can freeze, okay, the surface can freeze and the water below can stay liquid. And that's good. So the organisms inside can survive and swim around. And the ice actually acts as an insulating layer to keep the cold out from the waters below. And to prevent further freezing. So yeah, these are good things for aquatic organisms especially. Now, one more thing about aquatic organisms and water. Water is most dense at 4 degrees. And this, this is interesting because this means when water you know, increases the temperature from 0, which is ice, to 4 degrees, water would sink. 4 degree water will sink to the bottom of the ocean okay, and the, water, the rest of the water will be pushed up. So this would actually um, result in what result in uh, the circulation of nutrients. in the sea, right? Because water that is dense would sink and it washes up the nutrients to the top. So yeah, that is great for aquatic organisms as well. So yeah, those are waters and the different types of energies we're talking about, different states. Now let's just talk about water as a solvent. Now water as a solvent, uh, mostly is not due to its hydrogen bonding but because it is dipole because it's slightly positive on the hydrogen side and slightly negative on the oxygen side this allows it to uh, dissolve ions and polar molecules like oxygen co2 and ammonia and this is great because well it needs to dissolve in order to be transported especially in the blood however it's not a solvent for non-polar molecules just saying Last but not least, let's talk about water as uh, in the context of cohesion, adhesion, and surface temperature. Uh, sorry, surface tension, my brain. Cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. So what is cohesion and adhesion to begin with? Cohesion is when water molecules tend to stick to each other. So H2O, binding of H2O, this is cohesion. Adhesion, think of adhesive glues uh, is water with something else something else so these are surfaces or other molecules these are all considered as adhesion and all this is because of hydrogen bonds now what is it useful for number one transport of water in xylem tissue of plants right this forms uh long unbroken column of water as we see here okay water is pulled up during transpiration transpiration is the loss of water from plant and you can see here how the water since it has cohesion it like it's almost as if it's pulling each other upwards and maintain the flow and you can see at these regions here that there's adhesion going on so it's clinging onto the walls and being pulled up as well so this is how um this is how water moves against gravity in sand tissue and it's incredibly fascinating it's very high pressure okay it's traveling at high pressure very small tube against gravity because again because of the cohesion and adhesion of water. Okay, number two is high surface tension, and this is great for surface dwellers such as the pond skater. They can skate on the surface of the water without breaking the surface, and this relies on the surface tension. Okay, uh, the pond skater does not break the surface tension of the water, 
and therefore is able to walk on water. Yeah. So yeah, this is just a clip I love to show my students. It's it's based on the Jesus Christ lizard by National Geographic. You can see this lizard here, really cute. And when a snake comes, when a snake comes, what does it do? What does it do? It runs across the water. And how does it do this? Surface tension. Oh, look at it. It's walking on water. Just like Jesus. Amazing. Pretty cool, huh? Really fast too. Okay, this is a times two speed, but still pretty fast in real time. Anyway, search it up if you want to watch a full video. It's incredibly fascinating. And with that, we are pretty much done with all the five properties of water we need to know. And mostly it's due to its dipole nature and hydrogen bonding. And with that, we're also done with the entire chapter two. There is an example question at the end of this um, slideshow and you can look through it on your own. Uh, but there are quite a strange few strange points here such as like water is transparent so fish can see i'm like okay that's accepted but why but okay sure thank you but anyways yeah you can look through that on your own uh, i just want to remind you that there are four different biomolecules we have covered in this chapter and these are uh, some important things to remember number one you need to know all identification tests we will need to eventually run them in the labs together as well. You need to know the precise way of how to do it. You need to know and remember how. You need to know all bonds involved in every single biomolecule. Monomer and polymer names, role of all those biomolecules and all the examples I told you about. All the examples I taught are important and you do need to know the detail, the structure as well as its function. Now, when it comes to chemical structure, you do not need to know how to draw any chemical structures from scratch anyway. Okay, so they can draw some for you and ask you to do a condensation or hydrolysis reaction. So yeah, you're gonna need to die die memorize them, but you need to be able to be able to recognize them. You need to be able to recognize them. And for the exception to this rule is really amino acids, glycine alpha and beta glucose these few things you must know from scratch without reference the rest you may have some point of reference here and there may they are not difficult if you do have problems with chemistry you might not like this chapter more but again this is not difficult you can do this i believe in you i'll see you next time bye